thanks very much for being here. And I'd like to thank also the people who put this together, and of course, Buddha for bringing me here. And uh, I'm going to stick a little bit with Buddha. He's going to help me a little bit on the presentation later. Uh, it's very, very nice to have such a big uh, audience, a full room, on a discussion about money. But I have to say, I need this. All right. Uh, yes. OK. So I have to say that this was, prob would, this would probably not be the case five years ago. I think one of the main things that the financial crisis changed in our perception is our understanding of the importance on money. And I guess, you know, just going back to the theme of the conference, what's the matter with money, my initial response and what I'm going to try to argue here is uh, that money has become way too important, way too big, and has somehow infected our way of thinking in very uh, unexpected and very damaging ways. So if one sees the, the, the situation in the last, let's say, 20, 30 years, we see a progressive dominance of financial speculation over the real economy. But that's not the only uh, centrality of money, so to say. We see that money uh, is the instrument that uh, realizes the uh, global economy of unequal exchange. So if one thinks about the situation in Greece now, he will uh, uh, understand my point. Also, money has become um, uh, a ritual of initiation to the ideology of the market that somehow conditions our um, social relationships and our understanding on um, uh, behavior on every day, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And also money has become the instrument that regulates biopolitics. And this has to do much more with production and consumption. This is something that I'm going to talk a bit later. Uh, in my talk, I describe money as an image and as a language. And I think here is also the, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Uh, the people are waving on the back, so I was just worried. Uh, so one of the main um, um, characteristics of money is that it can reduce the properties of objects and relationships in the absolute quantity of economic value. And through that, money creates hierarchies. And these hierarchies inform in a very strong way all other forms of uh, all our forms of communication. We tend to think and compare things in monetary terms. And uh, this happens by the ability of money to invest in commodities and relationships through the um, um, uh, quantity of economic value. And this is extremely important in our uh, social um, um, reality because exactly these forms of representation are the ones that constitute sociality. The ability of money to represent things economically is the uh, let's say the property of money that makes it somehow kind of a language. And money does that in two ways. It, it does that uh, in its functions as a sign and in its functions as, a, as an image. And uh, it's very interesting to think money as a sign and how money relates, uh, let's say, to commodities. We discussed a little bit before in the open formats about commodification and the commodification. And money becomes more and more the master signifier of desire, the master signifier enjoyment. The individual and the market come together exactly because of this desire. The need to, let's say, fulfill specific kinds of um, uh, wants of the individual that somehow in the beginning is unarticulated and uh, often uncomprehensible is being transformed through the intervention of money into a desire. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to think how desire is played out in the market. And of course, if we think about commodification, about commodities, we could think that all these kind of objects that we find in the shop, in the marketplace, are always market, uh, marketed as a kind of um, uh, vehicles of forthcoming enjoyment. So we go to buy something because it's going to make, make us very happy. And by this intervention, money somehow markets itself as the main sign of uh, uh, of enjoyment, the main sign of desire. So progressively, what can happen, or what might happen, or what my argument is, is that we try, we, 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 un we learn to, let's say, picture our desire in terms of the price tag that a specific commodity has uh, attached uh, to itself. And it's also this other capacity of money to, this other capacity of money to represent desire. And here we talk about currency. And we can think about currency as a uh, plane where uh, 
uh, communities uh, constructed and articulated, but also as a screen where individual um, uh, subjectivities uh, constituted. And uh, by looking at uh, uh, currency as a proxy of, uh, let's say, this materialization of value, we can also understand certain uh, mysteries about how economic values reified. We could read the currencies uh, uh, through three different sets of patterns. Currencies have um, uh, iconographic, symbolic, and uh, security elements that uh, define them. And uh, I, this is a uh, old uh, kind of specimen of these more tra traditional elements, but you can see the same both in the Euro and in the early banknotes of the 17th and 18th century. The symbolic elements are the numerals and the dates, which are the name, the denomination, and um, the date of the, of the currency. And this provides, let's say, the linguistic identity of the currency. At the same time, you see landscapes and uh, personalities that try through this iconography to construct, let's say, a topos and a narrative of um, uh, cultural identity. So it's very important to, to see how nationality and common culture is, is represented. And of course, we have certain elements that are not so prevalent and so not so um, uh, apparent in this kind of um, uh, slide. And I'm talking here about the security elements, the holograms, the micro typography, uh, the, uh, the patterns that are uh, there in place on the one hand to manifest the legitimacy of currency as uh, the creature of the state, but also to uh, prevent the currency from uh, uh, its reproduction. This may seem somehow irrelevant in the discussion about desire and subjectivity, but in this juncture that security and surveillance become more and more important, I think it's very interesting to start reflecting also about these elements and about this biopolitical, let's say, uh, influence of that these elements have in our relationship to money and through the relations to money, uh, our relationship to money, to our relationship to the market. Yes, yes. Uh, it <laughs> Excuse me. So, uh, Benedict, Benedict Anderson, one of the most famous political um, uh, theorists of the 20th century, talked uh, about imagined communities. And by using this term, he tried to analyze, uh, let's say, the process where uh, by the constitution of a specific nationality is um, uh, processed. And by imagined, uh, Anderson didn't really suggest that the state or the nation is something that is not there, something that doesn't exist, but more, more or less that our relationship to the state is not a relationship that is, let's say, organized through a physical interaction. It's symbols, symbols like money, as I, I, I've been arguing, that somehow condition our relationship to the state by orienting uh, our perception, our imagination toward towards a specific narrative of nationality, towards a specific topography, towards a specific uh, uh, array of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of places and um, persons that somehow represent what is to be Greek, what is to be European, what, to be, what is to be Belgian in an everyday uh, uh, participation uh, in the market. And I think it's a very important uh, point of uh, coming together uh, of the national identity and the economic power in the very much in the representation of, uh, of currency. And here I would turn to a different kind of trope in order to, uh, to understand money. Here is kind of a, a mirror uh, image of a dollar that um, uh, where the, the symbol, the, the glyph of the dollar is somehow integrated uh, in, the, in the mirror surface. And through that I'm going to try to suggest how we tend to project our subjectivity through money to the society. How we can try to recognize ourselves as members of the society through the rituals of exchange, production, um, that uh, are regulated by money. So there are two important instances of uh, subjectivation in the market, and of course everybody will think about consumption and production, and in both cases money intervenes as a signifier of forthcoming enjoyment. On the one hand, as I suggested before, money is the vehicle that commodifies relationships and uh, objects by as ascribing them or constructing them as vehicles of uh, forthcoming enjoyment. At the same time, money gives uh, a particular uh, price tag to the individual through its um, uh, employment, through its uh, wage. So individuals tend to progressively think about their identity, about their um, uh, 
uh, participation in the, com uh, the community about their personal value exactly through money, exactly through how much money they, they make. And the same goes also through their ability to consume. So somehow money intervenes between the, in, the individual um, uh, contribution to the economic system and the personal identification by providing a specific kind of um, uh, quantity, a specific kind of um, uh, measure that compares each and every individual with the other individuals and also giving a place to the individual in, uh, in the market, in the community. So, I Initially, I, I talked a little bit and I thanked Buddha and uh, uh, somehow I think Buddha will be also the, the way out of this kind of dismal situation where money defines everything, when money becomes the language that defines our community, our subjectivity, our participation in the society. And uh, Buddha will function as a placeholder for many different things. Of course, for this amazing space that um, uh, uh, hosts every one of us here, and I'm talking uh, not so much about the, the center, but also the idea of culture and how culture and community create different kinds of bonds, create different kinds of relationships that are outside the market and allow for a different kind of subjectification. Buddha also can be a placeholder for uh, a denial of individuality, a denial of um, uh, subjectivity, and, and a denial of property. And in that sense, we could think uh, of a society that is not so much uh, defined or constrained by the mandates of money, the mandates of property, but more a society where individuality is something that uh, dissolves in community and allows for a sharing of um, enjoyment and desire beyond the mandates uh, of money. A different and uh, a last way to uh, uh, call back to Buddha is the uh, small uh, experiment that happened here today. I don't know how many of you were before in the open format event. Buddha was one of the alternative currencies that circulated and somehow made possible our interaction in this place. And uh, I think local exchange and trading systems is one of the ways that uh, people have found to reorganize themselves, to readdress the questions of value outside the market and not outside the um, um, uh, money that somehow has the um, um, kernel, has the promise of a community that is based on uh, real needs and uh, real relationships. Thank you. <laughs>